Hello, my name is Marie Manthe. I am the chair of the Heritage Committee for the History Center for the Future of Nursing at the University of Minnesota. This is a review of the formative years for the School of Nursing from 1909 to 1929. Founded in 09, this School of Nursing remains the longest continuously operating university nursing program in the world. Here we describe the individuals involved in this innovative program over 100 years ago. There is an ongoing rich history and pioneering spirit that has continually evolved into the programs that exist today. Reviewing this history of where we have come from strengthens the way for the future. The University of Minnesota School of Nursing was founded by a physician named Richard Olding Beard. He was a physiology professor in the School of Medicine and one of the four founders of that school. He believed that medical students should have formal scientific education before their apprenticeship training. When Dr. Beard became head of the physiology department, he visited Johns Hopkins Hospital where he met a distinguished nursing leader by the name of Isabel Hampton Robb. She convinced him of the value of educating nurses in academic institutions rather than in hospital-based apprenticeship training programs. When he returned to Minnesota, Dr. Beard presented this concept to the Board of Regents, who in 1908 approved the creation of a school for nurses. The first students were admitted in 1909. Throughout the first couple of decades of the school's existence, Richard Olding Beard was a passionate protector of this new, more formal, academic-based preparation for nurses. His colleagues nicknamed him the Nestor of Nurses from the Greek Nestor, a leader who protected young warriors in the Trojan Wars. Beard was deeply involved in supporting nursing education. His writings and letters show his ongoing concern and commitment. In this letter, dated January 3, 1925, to Marion Veneer, the School of Nursing's director at that time, he outlines five problem areas and provides concrete advice about how to address each problem. At the time, the School of Nursing Centennial in 2009, a Richard Olding Beard Award was created in his honor to recognize non-nurses who contribute significantly to the nursing profession. This award with a recipient list is displayed in the Dean's Corridor of the School of Nursing. Beard selected the first director of the school, a woman named Bertha Erdman, and arranged for her to attend Teachers College Columbia University for one year of graduate education before the school opened. Teachers College Columbia University had the only graduate program in the United States for nurses. Erdman opened the school for nurses in Minnesota in 1909 and ran it for the first year. At the end of that year, she developed tuberculosis and had to resign her position. Beard again looked to Teachers College Columbia University for help in replacing the director of the school. They recommended he appoint Louise Powell as the second director of the School for Nurses. She was in that position from 1910 to 1924. Louise Powell described her duties during the first year, showing the pioneering character of the work. Not only was she the sole instructor teaching nursing practice classes, she was also responsible for managing the housekeeping duties, planning meals for the patients and staff, and shopping for food supplies by telephone. After Paul attended the lectures given by physicians to the students, she created and held quiz classes to test their knowledge. She began to make changes in the nursing and hospital routines that would add uniformity and to write out directions and steps to nursing procedures. Since student nurses staffed the wards and attended lectures after working many hours, Powell insisted there should be no evening lectures. This change caused loud protests from the staff doctors, who were the instructors, since it cut into their office hours. She insisted and negotiated what was best for the education of nurses. Not everyone who applied to the school was admitted. One of the most controversial criteria was the requirement of a high school graduation certificate, which was not required for other nursing schools nationwide. Other requirements included physical fitness 
as well as mental, emotional, and spiritual fitness. Dr. Beard was particularly concerned about the overall maturity of the candidates. The first semester curriculum was called the preliminary course and included anatomy, physiology, bacteriology, chemistry, hospital economics, and physical education, as well as the history of nursing. All classes were taught by university faculty. During the first semester, there was no hospital duty. The second term included classes in principles and practices of nursing, dietetics, personal hygiene, and nursing ethics. The following two and one half years included theory and lectures and all clinical subjects with accompanying classes in nursing. Working in the hospital on the wards provided practical experiences. The first class graduated in 1912. There were eight students in that class, three of whom had baccalaureate degrees in other fields before entering the School for Nurses. Here, Louise Powell stands in the center of six of those graduates. The second class graduated in 1913. There were four students in that class, one of whom, Barbara Thompson, went on to become a faculty member and co-author of Marion Veneer's textbook of nursing procedures. The Alumni Association was formed in 1913. Minutes show that the first meeting was in January of 1914. All graduates were eligible but had to apply to be a member of the Alumni Association. Dues were $3 per year, of which $1 went to a health care fund to pay for physicians' fees for its members. At that time, the source of most employment for nurses was private duty, managed through a board of registry. The Alumni Association established a board of registry for employment and set fees for private duty nurses. The registry board did not change until the end of the Depression and World War II. Marion Veneer became Powell's assistant director in 1915 and succeeded her as the director in 1924. She and Barbara Thompson co-authored a textbook of nursing technique one of the first such books teaching specific methodologies. She was the director until 1930. Academic expectations of students met university standards from the start. Clinical education was based on classroom demonstrations followed by supervised practice with hospitalized patients. Hospital head nurses taught and supervised students on the wards. Student nurses provided direct nursing care and staffed the hospitals at this time. The university opened its first hospital in a three-story former fraternity house on Washington Avenue in 1909. This building had room for 25 patients, a basic operating room, and delivery room. Patients were carried by stairway to and from the operating room on the third floor. Two years later, in 1911, Elliott Memorial Hospital opened as the first teaching hospital integrated with and staffed by a university medical school. It now had elevators and was easy to transport patients, food, and laundry. Nursing students as well as graduate students were housed nearby to have easy access to the hospital. During World War I, the university was asked to organize a medical nursing unit to go abroad for war service. The most experienced head nurses were accepted to go with the hospital unit. That left many vacancies here at home and a challenge to fill them. In September of 1918, with the outbreak of influenza, the hospitals were emptied of all patients who could be moved to make room for the very ill. It, again, was a challenging time to staff the hospital. A bright spot in 1918 came when the university admitted three groups of 100 hospital corpsmen from the Navy because women were not allowed to serve on ships. These men, who would later go overseas on Navy ships, were given a four-month course of training 
to prepare them to care for the sick and wounded. All courses were intensive and practical. They were taught nursing procedures, preparing food for the sick, and basic sciences. Another war effort was to support the Army School of Nursing. Those students came to Minnesota for eight months of clinical experience in pediatrics and obstetrics. The school continued to grow. Louise Paul believed the university should offer the academic classes in the first semester in the preliminary course to other hospital-based nursing programs. To facilitate this belief, the Central School was established in 1921. The university partnered with Minneapolis General Hospital, Miller Hospital, and Northern Pacific Hospitals in St. Paul, and began to share the clinical experiences for nursing students. All of the students were enrolled at the university. Powell Hall was built in 1931 to provide housing for student nurses and named to honor Louise Powell's accomplishments. This was the first time a building was named on the University of Minnesota campus for a living person. With the experience gained during the war years and the influenza epidemic, the school developed a course in public health nursing, which became a standard class required for graduation. The University of Minnesota School of Nursing was the first professional nursing education program to be developed on a college level that has continued to this day. The first 20 years of history reflect the School of Nursing's commitment to leading the way in education for nurses. The pioneering spirit and efforts of its founders formed the basis of what continues today in nursing practice, scholarship, and research. The founders established vision, values, and a structure that has endured.